All right, and we are live from slightly snowy Arlington tonight. <laughs> um, we're going to let some folks, I always give people just a minute. Oh, goodness, somebody's already commented they're from Manassas. So uh, looking forward to hearing from Lori about chasing the American dream. It's awesome. Um, and, oh, my goodness. Okay, everybody's here. We got 39 people already on, so I'm not going to wait any longer. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and, and get us started. Um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Um, this is with One More Page Books, but from my basement at the moment. I'm not in the store. Um, so really happy that we can host this event. We've been hosting some really fun um, virtual author events for um, both local authors and um, authors from, from all over the place. Um, so happy to be able to provide this platform, even if we can't be together in the store, um, which is where I think we would all prefer to be. Um, but this evening, we're here um, to celebrate um, the publication of Lorelei Brush's new novel. Um, Lorelei holds two doctoral degrees, one in developmental psychology and the other in ministry. She spent much of her career researching and evaluating children's learning, and her two nonfiction books um, are on that work and addressing children's or uh, girls' participation in math. Um, and since 1996, Dr. Brush has worked on inter in international education, spending several years working abroad. And some of that work with Pakistani women helped inspire her first novel, which was called Uncovered. Um, and her new novel that we're here to celebrate tonight called Chasing the American Dream came out last week um, and was inspired by stories that her father told in her time researching those stories. So I'm interested to hear about that research and how this all came to be. Um, and we're really pleased that we get to host this celebration um, of her new novel. Um, and in conversation with Lorelai this evening um, is another local author, author that we've had the pleasure of working with um, over the last few years, Sarah Fitzgerald. Sarah is a retired journalist and award-winning author of both nonfiction and fiction. Uh, her most recent books include Conquering Heroines, which is a nonfiction work about Title IX, and The Poet's Girl, which was um, a fictional account of M Emily Hale and T.S. Eliot, um, which we were, um, I think we've been able to do events for, for both of those books, which makes me happy. Um, and I am going to now, I just want to remind everybody um, online, that you are more than welcome to comment or ask questions um, at any time during the event. Um, the best way to do that on Facebook is in the comment section. And if you're watching on YouTube, the um, live chat function there is where you can pop in any questions or comments. Um, and we will get to those um, during the evening. And with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Lori and Sarah. They are both muted right now. So when they're speaking, they're gonna unmute. Great, Amber. And Lori, it's great to be here with you tonight. And thank you for inviting me to, uh, to talk with you and ask some questions on behalf of the audience. I'm, I'm smiling to think that uh, I knew you as a friend. And then one day I went to a writer's conference and who did I see there but you? And oh, I guess Lori's writing books too. And we've both written fiction and nonfiction. So um, that's great. Why don't we dive on in? And I'll ask you a question that I often start you know, Mike talks about, and that is what inspired you to write this book? Uh, when I was little uh, growing up, in particular in the 50s, my father, who was in OSS during the Second World War, would tell me nighttime stories that were, were thrilling adventures of things he'd done during the war. And he made he made himself sound like such a a superhero. Um, when I started writing novels, my brother sat me down one day, we we're having a conversation about this, and he said, you really ought to write a novel about all of the incredible things dad did. I mean, you probably have to fictionalize because you probably won't be able to figure out all the details. But, you know, all those things he's saying were true and you really need. So when the National Archives opened up its, its uh, files on OSS and what the what they had done during the Second World War. This is the Office of Strategic Services, the spy corps of the United States. Um, I, I went in, I spent about six months doing research and I researched every hint I had from childhood stories, from any kind of records we had from my father. And it turned out everything that he told me as a story was a lie. And then the immediate reaction is, why? 
why did he feel it necessary to tell us these stories, which were just wonderful stories, and make himself out to be this phenomenal hero? I mean, did he think he needed to do that to his children? Why did he do that? And the process of writing this novel was a process of, of sort of starting from his war and asking why this was the particular um, effect it had on him. And uh, since he was an incredibly angry man all of the time that I knew him in the 50s and 60s, uh, he died in 1972. Um, the question I had was, how could he have, have taken what he didn't have in the war, the hero heroic actions that didn't come his way, how could he have done something in the 50s that would have made him a hero, made him feel differently about himself and made him less of an angry man? And that's very much where this book came from. Well, you started off maybe with an eye to writing a memoir or, yeah. or and at some point you pivoted to writing a novel and getting some different ideas and writing a little bit different story, obviously. So tell about how you made that decision and, and how you started to develop the plot of your novel. Um, I've watched several people trying to write memoirs and the trouble with the memoir in my case was, it seemed to me there was a beginning of the story and there was an end of the story. The beginning being all this hero worship of my father and the end being, being recognizing that he needed to be a hero in his own way. But there didn't seem to be in my own history with him, a progression. There seemed to be like two places that were discrete from one another. And it seemed like I needed, I didn't have any real good solid information about how he progressed because I didn't see him make progress over the time I knew him. So it didn't feel like a memoir was the right thing. I mean, to say I had an angry father, now I understand why. Eh, it seemed like figuring out something that would make him a hero was a more interesting way to go and would make a more interesting story, which needed to be fiction then. And we met the second half of your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good uh, that was a good answer. I think you took care of it. Uh, talk a little bit about um, how you started to develop your plot, and and you know maybe a little bit about your research, and then maybe after you do that, I'll have you read a little bit of it to kind of set the stage uh, for the book. Sure. Well, one of the things we had several pieces of information from my father's work in the war. We had the papers that he filled out when he initially went in, sort of his application and all of that paperwork. We had his mustering out papers and we had some badges and he'd been in the target forces. And that was one of the first places I started with in the archives. And the target forces turned out to be an interesting group of people who, who were put together by the OSS in order for the United States to gain as much as possible from the Second World War and not be caught wanting as we had at the beginning of that war. And we were wanting because we didn't have good maps of Germany, of Italy, of ports that were possible and what the development in the ports had been. So it was difficult to move troops and know exactly where what you were going to run into. And in fact, in some cases, people were using picture postcards from vacations to try to get a, a real feel of what was going on in a city without knowing what year those postcards had been, the pictures had been taken or anything like that. And the target forces also came to be because the US was very worried that Germany was 10 to 15 years ahead of us in science. How would we capture all of the information that they had and not for instance, let it go to the Russians? So I started researching a lot more about that and that gave me an impetus for where to start the book and the kinds of things that, that could have evolved from that. Um, I think also, uh, I'm trying to think from the beginning of the war, ah, one of the things I knew about my father was that he had worked first of all in the, at the Sun Rubber Company in Akron, Ohio. That is to say he, he had enlisted the day after Pearl Harbor on December 8th he had mustered in and he was assigned to the chemical warfare service because of his background in physics and chemistry. And 
the chemical warfare service in their infinite wisdom made him the, the army liaison with this company, the Sun Rubber Company in Akron. And <clears throat> under contract to the federal government, the Sun Rubber Company was working with Disney to design gas masks for children where the gas masks, uh, Sun Rubber Company made rubber squeaky toys. So the Sun Rubber Company was going to make Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck masks for, the, for children so they'd want to put their gas masks on, which sounds like a wonderful idea. But as far as my father was concerned, and he spoke about this at length, it was a Mickey Mouse job. And it was not anything that was going to make him a hero. And he was embarrassed to talk about it to the other men in his, his outfit then that he would report to, um, I don't know what's weekly or monthly. And, and here they were all going off to be heroes in the European theater, the Asian theater, whatever. And he was in Akron, Ohio. So I knew he was really disappointed in the beginning of his war. And I was curious about what was happening at the first possible opportunity when there was, were volunteers being taken for what they knew was OSS, although it was supposed to be secret, his hand went up and, and he was must, he then had an opportunity to do something that he thought was going to be really exciting and heroic. And then he was assigned as the secretary of the head of secret intelligence in London. So he was making arrangements for other people to go and be spies within France, within Germany. And, you know, their travel arrangements, making sure they had the right clothing and so forth. But he was in London. So little by little, I was seeing that he didn't get to the continent until, and anyway, he never was behind German lines. And he used to tell great stories about the heroic things he did as this spy behind German lines. So that's awesome. And some of those things, but that he was reading about what other people were going off to do right. inspired some of his tales, didn't they? And, and also led to some of the things that you started to develop in your plot. Right. Right. Do you want to read a little bit of your book? Sure. This is a, a reading from the prologue. So it's just a, it's the setting up of the whole, what happened during World War II to this character, David Savela, very loosely based on my father. What is that stench, Jim Atkins asked, wrinkling up his nose. Mac McKenzie cleared his throat and glanced over at Jim from the driver's seat. Dead bodies, son. The truck crawled up the incline and stopped just before the road turned. David climbed out and sidled up to the lieutenant, Edwin Tippett, who had his binoculars raking a seemingly empty compound. Big area surrounded by high wire fencing electrified. Had a sort of parade ground near the entrance and rows of one story wooden barracks. At the corners of the fencing and next to the gate were guard posts now empty and the front gates hung open. An ambush? Or had the guards fled? Tippett let the binoculars fall to his chest. He signaled for two squads to move in. Don't shoot. Flush out whoever's in there. Bring them into this empty space. The squads moved inside the gates. David tapped Tippett's shoulder. White flag at 11 o'clock. He pointed to a group of five skeletal specters staggering toward them. The one front and center brandished a stick with a rag attached and fluttering in the driving rain. David glanced at Tippett's horrified expression and said, it's one of those camps. I'm going up there, see what we can do. Those poor bastards. The head of the procession planted his white flag maybe 50 yards from Tippett and David. The other walking corpses stood behind it, swaying slightly, as though they understood waiting. Unfurling himself to his full height, the procession's leader spoke. Guten Morgen, mein Herren. It was an educated voice, a pure Hochdeutsch, that sent a shiver through David. He took a deep breath, gearing himself up to enter the compound. With a nod from the lieutenant, he called out in his soldiers, German, what is this place? Silently, he thanked his OSS trainers for insisting they all speak only German. This is Dora, the man replied, the labor camp for the V2 rocket facility. We are the labor that's left. Have you food, medicine? We have typhus, diphtheria, who knows what else? The poor man shook and it seemed at any moment that he would fall. David headed for the white flag. The smell of sick and unwashed bodies made him rub his nose. But seeing the leader flinch, he put his arm down. May I introduce myself, Captain David Savela? 
United States Army, who might you be? The leader lifted one edge of his lips into a strained smile. I'm the shadow of Herbert Landau, violinist emeritus of the Berlin Philharmonic, and now specializing in keeping inventories of rocket parts. He put out his hand and David gently shook it, afraid that the sticks of bone would crack if he squeezed. Please, we need food. We'll do all we can, that's a promise. But you sure all the guards are gone? David looked around, suddenly feeling vulnerable. Landau waved a dismissive hand. They heard you were coming. One of the men behind Landau slipped to his knees, his yellowed face a mass of pained wrinkles. A soldier caught him, laid him shivering on the ground and covered him with his thick U.S. Army jacket. Food, please, the prostrate man said. His pleading voice was a mere feather in the wind. David pulled a candy bar from his pocket, one of those that came with their emergency D rations. The bar was supposed to have enough nutrients to keep a soldier going for hours, but he had no idea how it'd affect a starving man. Still, it was all he had. Eat it slowly, okay? The man struggled to sit up, ripped off, ripped off the foil cover and took an eager bite. As he chewed, pain crossed his face and then a broad smile. Chocolate. David was surprised. GIs only ate these bars out of necessity. The prisoner took a second bite. His teeth seemed to slip off the chunk, refusing to mash it down. Then he looked greedily at the remainder of the bar and tried to swallow the mass in his mouth. He choked tried to cough and stuck a finger in his mouth. David slid down to his knees, forced the man's jaw open and searched for purchase on the slippery candy bar. It was jammed in the guy's throat. David turned him over and hit his back between the shoulder blades, desperate to get the food unstuck. At the same time, he worried he'd break the man's back. The body lost its tension, withering in David's arms. One of Tippett's soldiers, who'd watched the whole thing, squatted down and held his hand over the man's mouth. No breath, Captain. Then he pressed the side of his neck. Can't find a pulse either, either, sir. Sorry. David stared at the man he'd just killed and threw up. Here he was, trying to do something good, save a life, and he'd taken it instead. What kind of a hero was he turning out to be? Landau leaned on his staff and closed his eyes for a moment. We called him Samson, but his real name was Isaac, Isaac Chornier. He had thick black hair once and blew a powerful trumpet. David laid Isaac's body out on the ground, gently straightening out the jacket that still covered his chest. He pushed some frizzled hair off the dead man's face. I'm sorry, so sorry. Landau sighed. Have you perhaps more gentle food? But that's a good demonstration of how authors can often be very good narrators of audiobooks. Wow. Uh, they know what they want to say and uh, do it well. So thanks for sharing that with us. Well, you we started with an idea involving the OSS, and and then you got your idea to set it at the liberation of the camps and the Holocaust. Talk a little bit about um, your research and, and how you develop the various parts of your plots and if did one idea lead to the next. And mm -hmm. the other thing I'd be think fun to talk about is, because I've done it too, is going out to the National Archives in College Park and sharing what that's like. But those are a lot of questions, so <laughs> we'll go to it. I, th I find research fascinating, and I, I tried to do a lot of it before writing the book but then things kept coming up during the writing that needed research. So, so there are multiple steps in that process. The archives I found fascinating, as much as anything else, to find people, historians, who are fascinated by, by what's in these old papers and the people who will, who will spend lots of their time helping you with your research. So shout out to the National Archives folks. But one of the things I could do is they, they started me off with things like, well, look at his personnel file. So they got out his personnel file and his personnel file had like three sheets of that old onion skin paper that we used as, as after the carbon copies of things. And it had basically his application to be part of OSS. That was it. So that didn't work. But then he had told me throughout my life that his code name when he was behind uh, German lines 
was Lorelei. And because it had, the reason he gave me that name was because it had kept him safe all of that time he spent behind German lines. So next thing I tried was uh, all the code names that were ever used for people in OSS during the Second World War. And it turned out that Lorelei was never used as a code name so for, for personnel. So then I thought, well, maybe it was an action of some sort that, so I went through all the code names, the various, there was never an action whose code name was Lorelei. So then he had talked about um, the, uh, how he had been asked to go negotiate with a group of Russians and how he had thought it was going to be a, this, this actually is in the book too. He had thought this was going to be a, um, an ambush of some sort and he was very worried about it. So he posted his men on either side of this, this sort of canyon that they were, they were meeting in. And when the Russian officers approached on horseback, he had his, he, uh, anyway, they got out their rifles as though they were going to shoot my father and his, his forward team. So my father hit the dust and all the men that he had positioned on the hill shot the Russians. And then in my father's story, um, Stalin cabled Roosevelt to say, court-martial that man who was in charge of that group and killed all of my officers. Well, so I went to uh, Roosevelt's home on, on the Hudson River where all of the cables, every cable that was ever sent to Stalin and that Stalin ever sent to him is now stored. There was no such cable. Okay, so that, that was part of it. I, I think I also, once I wanted to play, I also went to the archives of Case Western Reserve, particularly looking at the Case Institute of Technology before they merged, because that was what was true at the time in 1955, where I'm setting most of the novel. And about half of the faculty at Case at that time had German last names. And I thought, well, 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 we know that at the end of the war, uh, or I discovered a lot more about this than I knew, at the end of the war, the United States brought many German scientists to this country to be able to use all of the research that they had managed to gather that put them ahead of the US, especially in rocketry and engines and so on. And they, uh, they were stationed partly in Huntsville, Alabama, that's where Werner von Braun was, but there was also a group at um, the Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. And what happened there, uh, and I have just lost the name of that, it, it will come. Right, Patterson. Um, thank you. Um, so at Wright Patterson, what would happen is after they had felt the Germans had given them the information they needed, they would help them find jobs. And it just made sense that some of them would be going up to right uh, up to Case Western Case Institute of Technology at that point. And also in Cleveland is a very was at that time the Lewis Laboratories the did a lot with jet propulsion. They would have gotten government, they had government contracts. I researched them to find out what contracts they were holding. And then it was interesting sorts of stuff from that. The person who was head of Lewis Labs was Jewish. The neighborhood I grew up in was Jewish. There's a great Jewish history museum very close by, which talked a lot about World War II. Um, the conservative Jewish synagogues had people who were, were Holocaust survivors. Um, the father of one of my students when I taught at Wesleyan was the journalist who covered the Nuremberg trials and I talked with him. They were, the children were part of a group of uh, folks sort of approximately my age who were the children of Holocaust survivors. So I managed through them to talk to some Holocaust survivors about the 50s, talk to the children about what it was like to grow up with a parent as a, and they basically heard nothing from their parents about their experiences. But it one piece of information would lead to another. So I spent time in Cleveland with high school friends actually researching what was going on there at the time and then was able to write, I think fairly, about, uh, about what, was, what was happening at that time and create a story for this man starting in 1955 and seeing a German who he had sent to Nuremberg walking down the streets of Cleveland. What was he doing there? And your plot flows from there and as exciting. Did you think when you were working on the book, your main character, David, is um, 
somebody who's uh, very angry. He has a fighting spirit. So he's like your father. There are two questions related to that. Did you feel you were working out some of your emotion about your father in terms of dealing with David and creating that character and trying to understand him? And were there any challenges in terms of David being the main character and making him sympathetic? I certainly was starting with my father. And I think as is true for, for most authors who are writing from a character they know, there's a point at which the character says to you, I'm not going to do that anymore. And, and so I started with him and then realized at some point that I that I had to drop him and I had to make this character grow in ways that it was appropriate for the character to grow. And the ways that I wanted that character to grow were ways my father never did. So this was how do you become a more humble person? How do you come to understand that the talents you have can be heroic. You don't have to be a superhero in the old classical sense of uh, killing dragons, etc., in order to be heroic to your children. And what it meant was he was a hero in a, in a sort of everyman hero way, every man having lots of, of flaws, as well as this energy and possibility of becoming a hero. And I think it's it's then hard because your every man isn't somebody that is particularly lovable by readers, but he's somebody who you can understand, somebody who's true to who he is and comes out and, and has a hero's journey so that at the end, he is a changed person. Um, so he's not necessarily the favorite character that some of my readers tell me they have in the book, but he is certainly somebody they are on board with to be able to see through to the end of the book. You talked about your brother um, at the start and how you re you know your research actually dispelled his notions of his father being a hero. How how did he respond to your book, and how have some of your other family members uh, responded to your work and sort of you know debunking your father's stories? Right. Well, one of the first things I did when I finished my time in the National Archives was to, to write up this extensive 35 single page, single spaced um, account of where dad was every day. He was, he was abroad in the Eastern Theater of Operations for the time, for the 11, well, no, 12 months that he was there. And I gave that to my brother who, um, I, I might report was a John Birch Republican, and he he idolized my father, absolutely idolized him. And he picked it up and he read the first couple of paragraphs and he threw it across the room and said, I don't believe a word of this. And he, uh, he in the course of my writing the book, didn't want to hear about it, didn't want to know anything that was going to in any way disparage or or debunk what his view of dad was. Now, um, he died four years ago, so he never actually saw the book. I, I did um, send the book to, to his son. Let's see, so, so my father's Edwin Franklin Brush and my brother was Edwin Franklin Brush Jr. And my son is Edwin Franklin Brush, the, my nephew is Edwin Franklin Brush the third. So anyway, and, and um, Ed, the, thir the, the nephew, was in the Navy for 20 years. And he wrote me a very long, very interesting letter about how often um, he, he would carry out a mission in Iraq or Afghanistan, he's a pilot, and he would write up the mission or the mission would be written up by, by his commander. I'm not sure exactly who did the writing. And two or three days later, the write-up would disappear. And that I shouldn't think that just because I couldn't find specific information about what my father did, that he still might have done these things. So it, it's an interesting um, multi-generational phenomenon where there are the men on one side and there's me on the other. I don't know. Um, I don't know where Ed came out. He enjoyed the book. So I have to say that's for the good news. So you know, it's a problem. Both of my parents are deceased as well, so that I don't actually have anyone in my immediate family, but I, I have encouraged cousins and relatives uh, to, 
to read it and to write and please let me know what they think. And I have gotten a couple of emails already just about my intention of writing about this or my suggestion of here's what I have written, just to tell me stories about my father and their experience, which um, the, this, the two have been both from women and both of them have, have, have had my view of my father as opposed to my brother's. So. Well, it's probably reassuring if, if they said that we, we thought your father was that way too. Right? Yeah, exactly. now, you, you just referenced to the fact that you finished your book four years ago. And I actually read most of it in the past month. And reading it against our current background, I was really struck how current some of your themes are in a, a difficult way in terms of um, you know, David defining himself as a as a patriot and taking things into his own hands and, you know, discovering that the powers that be at the time didn't agree that that was the way things should be handled. It's a very different situation than what we're dealing with today. But um, you, it's sort of, to me, I mean, was interesting in terms of, you know, how he was viewing his world and, you um, you know, even in some ways, the deep state and all of that. Would you like to to comment a little bit on that? I mean, I think you, you may feel as an author, you're lucky that you write a book four years ago, and suddenly when it comes out, it's it it has relevant. particular relevance that you might not have counted on the, back when you when you you know sent it off for the first time or whatever. Right. Well, I think the one of the first um, themes actually is maybe is these this issue of accountability that um, at the end of the war, at the end of the Second World War, there were a certain group of high level officers who were brought to trial and some who were, who were not at Nuremberg, but at, at sub trials in different areas of Germany. But there were a lot of people who could be held accountable for a number of deaths, for a number of, of crimes of, of, against humanity not just the kinds of things that one might expect to happen in war, who were not held accountable. And there was an article in the Post today about a man who's 100 years old, who today was in Germany, uh, put behind bars or convicted of having uh, committed crimes against humanity. But they could do that now because it's a very different time and a very different context. And accountability, of course, comes up in the midst of this, this uh, trial of Trump and the question of what constitutes accountability and for whom and when we really want, when we really have the political will to hold people accountable is, is very much what is talked about in the book and is also relevant today. Um, I think one of the other pieces that's a theme in this book is is a theme that follows the thread of forgiveness of when you need to let go of what happened in the past and what process you might need to go through in order to be able to let go. It comes up because there is a, a Jewish character in the book who is in a real struggle with, with the idea that he might be put in face to face against this man who was this German SS officer who caused him great personal suffering. Was he in any way obligated or to forgive this man for what he did? So the whole discussion of what is required for forgiveness that, and the beginning of it being that the person who has done the wrong needs to recognize he's done that wrong and ask and do something that shows he can atone for that wrong. And if that isn't possible, then the man who was acted against doesn't have to forgive. It's just not even an appropriate thing to do if there wasn't accountability. And as we talk now about, and Joe Biden talks about, how do we get to unity in the country? With that kind of philosophy, it's very difficult to see if there is no accountability, how we come to a unity where those of us on the other side thinking should be held accountable are able to speak 
with com with with real understanding to each other and and es essentially forgive what happened i find that very difficult and in fact not going to happen i just can't see it happening so that was that theme in the book also comes up today well, related to that too were people uh wives and relatives and you know people in kind of the circles of some of these characters um sort of saying, get over it, let it go. You're too wrapped up in it. And I think some of us find some tension about that these days, even if you know we're not directly involved of, of the people who say we're never gonna get to unity unless you can let go of your anger. And right. so I don't know if you wanna say anything more about that. Well, that's, I think for both David's wife and for my Jewish character, Jacob's wife, that is an issue. Why do you have to keep going into this? Why do you have to keep pursuing this? Can't you see that this is really destructive for the family? And certainly the military industrial complex is saying, look at what we're gaining from these scientists. Look at the power that this company country has, that we're entering into that era of, of the, the real difficulties, the Cold War with Russia. And that has to be our priority. Get over this. World War II, we're done with it. And yet, you know, it didn't work for some people to be able to say that. The forgiveness wasn't there, the ability to move on. Yeah. Let's shift gears a second and talk a little bit about the writer's life. And um, you find, uh, I know you, you're probably working on some new projects. And But before I ask you about, about that, um, how do you find being as a writer during this time? Is it is it good to have the, the quiet and the focus or, or is it frustrating if you want to be out doing research? Uh, how have you found it to be? Well, my my ideal writer's process is to is to go to a, a coffee shop and plant myself in that coffee shop with my computer and not let myself go until I've written a scene or I've edited yesterday's work and and then proceeded with today's scene. And I don't let myself get onto Wi-Fi because, well, Wi-Fi, you shouldn't get on Wi-Fi in places where you know the Wi-Fi can be hacked. And so I never get on Wi-Fi. I can't do any internet research. I can't play any games. I have to work. Well, you know, home is different when you're working it. I have a lovely office at home. But I have two cats who come in and bother me regularly because they think if I'm home, I should be petting them. What else would you do when you're at home? And then I notice the laundry that needs doing or, or gee, I could, you know, I could benefit from a, a, another cup of tea or something. So it is harder to work now and discipline myself. But on the other hand, it's very quiet. So the quiet is, can be very conducive too to getting things done. I, I am getting some work done, but but not as much as I would like. I'm looking forward to coffee houses opening again. Well, I think we all are, whether or not we're writing there or not. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone ever come up to you when you're in the coffee house and say, you got to tell my story? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It's interesting well, you get to know the people who are there as regulars, but but you get to know them as a as a wave rather than as deep conversations because everybody's working. Are you working on a new idea, a new project if you if you're free to talk about it? Yes, I am. This is a this is a completely different topic, but this is this new book. Um, it's at the moment called Dancing in the Moonlight. Don't know if it'll stay with that topic, but it's the story of a young married couple in their 20s who have a child and as the child the child's about 4 when the book begins and they are discovering that this is a child with disabilities. Uh, they're not visible disabilities, but they're all brain-related disabilities. And, and as time goes on in this discovery process, one of the things they find out is that the issues with the child are genetic and that they come through the father's family. And the father gets completely blown away by this and distressed and depressed and the mother is trying really hard to figure out what to do best for the child, but she can't figure out what to do with this husband either. And uh, anyway, it's a developing story about how this couple manages to deal 
with the medical community, the broader therapeutic community, the school community, and what's going on inside their marriage in order to really be able to help the child. Is it going to be written from uh, both of their points of view or from the woman's point of view? It's both. It's both. It, 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 it starts out with both for the first 10 chapters or so, and then it becomes the woman's. Did you find it hard in, in chasing the dream to get into male point of view and some some very male oriented scenes, VFW Hall and, and these military scenes and all? I feel like I grew up in a very male household and and in in a a community where where men were in charge. So that that felt very normal. Um and my father talked so much about the army. It felt that there was, you know, that, that that also was a life I lived, even though I only lived it vicariously through him. So that that didn't seem difficult. Well, Amber, we've been talking a lot. There may be some people who have some questions and we'd like to in, encourage uh, others to ask questions too. Yeah, definitely. Um, I will say the last comment we got, um, from Sarah, or I'm sorry, from Allison says, Sarah, you're great, you ask great <laughs> questions. And Laura, you're a fabulous storyteller. So I just thought I'd pop that one up. Um, we Thank do have you. some questions though. Um, uh, several comments, so Laura, you may wanna pop in later and just take a look at the comments. But um, Sharon Kay has two questions. Um, one, do you think it was your father's intent to mislead you um, when you were a child? Uh, one of the things I learned in my research at the archives was that everybody in OSS at the end of the war had to sign an oath that was just like a sacred oath that they would never speak of what they did during the war. And I think that my father absolutely obeyed that. At the same time, I think he needed to be a hero and, and so he invented himself that way. I don't think he felt he was lying. I felt, I think he felt he was telling a good story. It's not exactly an answer, but there we are. So you research more and more, did it change? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I just read the second half of Sharon's questions. And, and uh, at the end of the archives research, I, my sense was that, well, there was a moment at the end of this archives research when I was sitting there putting it all together and knowing that my father had lied about all of all of this stuff that he was doing, that I just sat and and looked at myself and and said to my father, sort of sitting across the room, you know, you bastard, you had to put us through all of this hero worship stuff. And you are a human being with your feet on the ground, just like the rest of us. And it just, it felt like there was just this huge, you know, release of energy that I didn't have to be angry with him anymore for, for not being, you know, loving and, and caring for his children, for being angry all the time. I knew why he was angry and all right, let that one go. That was, yeah, that was fine. So there was a big, uh, I don't know, cathartic experience out of having done that research. Um, so Susan, it's not really a question, but a comment that her dad was also um, OSS, oh. but didn't really talk about it. I'm just curious, I can make a question out of that. Uh, you know, what other, did you talk to other um, children of, of parents who were in the OSS and, and what their experience was? I did not, but I'm very interested to talk to Susan Landry now. That's great because the target, she had, sounds like her father was part of the target forces as well because they were the ones going into um German cities as soon as the German army left. So within two, three days at the longest, because they didn't want the Germans to destroy any materials before the Americans could get hold of them or the allies. So yeah, oh good, all right. Watch this piece later. One, one point I mentioned to Lori is um, when I was out at the National Archives doing some work for one of my books, I was, uh, struck by the number of people who were coming in there and doing military research. And I think there's a lot of curiosity of people um, trying to track down their family stories. And as she mentioned, the staff, you know, tries to be as helpful as they can. Uh, you can ask questions kind of prep in advance and, you know, they'll give you some guidance once you get there. And uh, 
I was telling Lori in my own case, my father didn't have an exciting career. He worked for General Motors and his job was to get the assembly lines rolling as fast as possible. So he was very proud of that. But again, it was a, a different kind of wartime experience. And uh, you know, it's, so it's interesting to try to, re, you know, go back and find out more details about him. And the, the actual first title of this book when I was thinking about writing it was, what did you do in the war, daddy? So same idea. So I don't see other questions at the moment. If anybody has them, please go ahead and pop them in um, comments on Facebook and chat on YouTube. Um, but I did wanted to pop this one up that Ramus said that sounds like your dad was a great storyteller too. You know, um, Lori, one point I'd like to make in this setting and would love to hear what you think too, is it has occurred to me that over the past year, many of us are sorting out our houses and sometimes helping parents or grandparents clean out things. And I always, and try to remind people, don't be so quick to throw something out because it might have value to, to a researcher. And, um, you know, and you can find a library. I mean, usually they're going to, you know, they're not going to take all of your junk, but there are libraries that do try to, to collect diaries or veterans records or whatever it may be. And, it, and, you know, you may not think it's, it's, you know, valuable, but it may provide a slice of life to somebody like you or me or a historical, you know, someone writing in history as well. And so encourage people to, if they're getting rid of something to consider not throwing it in the trash can. Sounds good. Sounds good. We have a couple more questions. Um, there we go. Margaret, did you learn anything new from writing about the effect of David's passionate pursuit of justice on his family? And was it fair to them? Now that's a really tough question. I think the biggest learning or the biggest takeaway from that is that these unintended consequences which occur to people who are related to these folks who want to be heroes can really be devastating. And, and that's what happened to David in the book. And the question stressed his marriage to the point of nearly breaking. And while he was, and, and it separated him for a time from his children. So the kinds of things that you choose that you wanna do out of passions can really disrupt every other part of your life. And I think that's, a, that, that's an important, probably important lesson for, for all of us as we pursue things that are our passions, are we still paying attention to what's happening with our relationships at the time, at that time? Um, I don't know what else I've learned. Hmm. I was just going to add, so uh, Margaret followed up with how does one balance a passion like that against the greater needs of the family? <laughs> I wish I had the answer to that, Margaret. Um, I think that that depends upon each family and it defines upon what this passion is creating as, as stresses for the family. But wow, yeah, it's going to create something. Some stresses in for sure. Um, Diana was asking, do you think your father's storytelling influenced you wanting to tell stories? Oh, how interesting. Um, uh, I, what I remember most about my father and what I really took away from my father is he was utterly a data and science person in his daily life. And he got a law degree through the GI Bill and he was a man who, would, who could cite you every case that was relevant to some issue or other. He, he, was, he was very data and detail oriented and very involved in physics and chemistry. He continually took courses through summers, you know, supposedly building for a PhD, although he never finished the PhD. And, um, and I never thought of him as a storyteller. Um, and even this process of writing the book until Diana, and these people are talking to dad, my father is a storyteller. I, I never, I'd never thought of him that way. He was, he was my science dad who was over there on, on the data side and 
and I would worry about stories. But he also was very adamant that that his children should grow up as scientists. And I majored in mathematics in college and took a lot of chemistry. And um, and the subject that I got the poorest grades in <laughs> was English. And and that was because the teachers used to say, write a short story about anything. And I was positive that there were some things that it was good to write about and some things that it was bad and I could never figure out what the good ones were. So I, I would get a B plus instead of an A and, and I always did well in science. And when I finished college, my father said, good, you majored in math. Now you can be a high school math teacher and you'll have a job for the rest of your life. And I said, but I'm not interested in teaching high school math that I wanna to go to graduate school. And he said, you shouldn't go to graduate school. That's a bad idea. No man will marry a woman who's more educated than he is. And I went to graduate school anyway. And 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 anyway, and then I took a job teaching at a university and my father said, well, I guess it's a good place for you to be, but I think this is a bad idea. You should have taught math in high school. He never got over that. So anyway. That, that comment or the question, Lori, makes me ask another question, which I've wrestled with uh, when you're writing uh, fiction that's based on historical time. Was there anything that you came across that you had to, you know, fudge the history a little bit to make it work for your book? Or did you really try to, um, you know, stay within the facts, you know, as much as you could? Um, I think I stayed within the facts pretty well. I mean, I, I'm sure there may be parts of uniforms, parts of, of something related to this that, oh, yes, one person has already told me that you never say over and out at the end of a conversation, and I have that in one of the conversations. So I know there are things that I that I made mistakes on already, and there are, I'm sure there are history police out there who are going to find others, but by and large, uh, I stayed as true as I could. I certainly did to the timings of when this stuff was happening. But, oh God. Oh, I have a, I have a, an in-home question. Are there other scenes in the book that actually happened with your father? Many of the scenes that in the book that are father and son, father and daughter are ones that actually happened. So, so reading stories to me at reading Charlotte's web to me at my night, I, I'm sorry, reading Charlotte's web to Hildy, the daughter in the story at night happened and um, reading the Hardy boys books to my brother happened. So things like that. And on our kitchen table, uh, we always had, milk in a in a jug whatever that looked like a cow and you pour it out of the cow's mouth so there are things from my household as well as things from my interactions that actually came from from the reality of growing up in the 50s how about the the characters of the two kids you painted oh yeah father was much much more of the fighter than what than the brother was yeah. were those the dynamics of your own family yeah mm -hmm. When I was seven, I had a fight with a little boy across the street and I, it was in the living room because it must've been in winter or something. And I knocked his head into the coffee table and he bled all over everything. And anyway, that was the last time. Our parents encouraged us not to please carry on that activity. So that was my last fight, but yeah. <laughs> yes, I was the feisty one and my brother was the one who hid and read and whatever. And was not coordinated. My father um, had tried out for the Olympics in 1936 as a speed skater and was beat out of what he felt was his position on the Olympic team. And my brother was was really uncoordinated. And he used to like my mother's favorite story. When he was five, he would run into the middle of the kiddie pool and fall down flat on his face underwater and lay there until she would come and pick him up. He just couldn't quite get together how you you work things out. Poor guy. You've got a lot of good anecdotes you can work into. Your I really want to see the book that's about the, uh, you know, the the Mickey Mouse plastic masks in World War II, you know, that I think that has some real possibilities. Right. There you go. Actually, that that sort of episode is in the book in, in, in a way. But 
Um, I don't have a picture of one of the gas masks with Mickey Mouse on the front. I don't know that whether that's because it never really went into production, that it was only you know conceived of at the time my father was there, or whether they just have disappeared over time. Any other questions? I see one more question. And then we will. Allison, how do children in the same family grow up to be so different? This always floors me. <laughs> are, are you saying, Allison, that you and Amanda are not different? Oh my, okay, so very different. I think male and female makes a whole lot of difference, especially in the 1950s. There was just all kinds of things that I wasn't allowed to do and my brother was allowed to do. And I can't think of any vice versa, but that was certainly true. So, and, and genetics can really create different children in families. I think there, there are probably other people who are in on this conversation who could comment on that. Funny. All right, well, um, thank you so much for this evening. It's been a, such a nice chat. Um, it looks like everybody online has really enjoyed it as well and have some of them have started the book and are enjoying it, so. Um, I think you have some fans here. <laughs> Order it for all your friends. That would be fine too. There you go. <laughs> so uh, I just want to thank both of you so much for taking the time this evening, Sarah. Thanks so much for, for being our conversant. Um, and oh, sorry. Um, I hope everybody has a nice evening. Enjoy the snow if we get snow, snow. <laughs> all right. Thanks, y'all. Good night.